Hello and welcome. Uh, it gives me huge pleasure to have you all here for the third annual symposium of the Applied Social Sciences Group within the Primary Care Unit. Um, the uh, topic for today's talk is uh, Childhood Social Disadvantage and Physical Health Across the Lifespan Mechanisms and Moderators. And it's the first of two talks um, this evening and tomorrow evening, both of which will be here. Um, a first thing to say is a few thank yous. Uh, one is to Guy Skinner, who's done so much work in putting this together. Uh, another thank you is to the Wellcome Trust um, for uh, helping sponsor this event. Um, before we begin, um, just a few um, practical things. One is that um, there's going to be lots of time for discussion and questions after hearing from our speaker and the discussant. Um, please don't speak until the microphone comes to you, because otherwise other people won't be able to hear you. Um, so that would be great if you can keep that uh, question until the microphone comes. Another is that this lecture is going to be recorded. Um, um, Greg and uh, Edith, their uh, uh, research has been a really key part of the teaching uh, that I and others do as part of the social context of health and illness course to the medical students. Um, and so therefore one of the things that we would like to do is to be able to have this lecture available to future generations of medical students at Cambridge who will be able to see uh, Greg and Edith um, talking at Cambridge and make that research feel a little bit closer uh, to them as well as be able to hear the discussion of the questions. Um, another thing that I mentioned just in terms of um, practicalities is that we also have some upcoming events that it would be perhaps worth taking note of. Um, so one is that the, um, the, uh, one of our discussants, Marian backermans Kranenberg, will be delivering uh, the Bradford Hill Seminar on Friday the 18th of May um, between 1 and 2 p.m. And that's going to be in the Institute of Public Health. And the, the lecture is going to be on the power of parenting support. I suspect that if you are interested in this talk, then um, it will be a talk that will be of great interest um, and so therefore that's well worth noting. Um, another uh, event that's taking place that again is, is uh, relevant here um, is a conference that's going to be taking place on the 1st of June here at St John's, um, Comparative Perspectives on Social Inequalities in Life and Death, an Interdisciplinary Conference, thinking about the way in which uh, human development and human social inequalities um, can be understood in comparative perspective with other non-human primates. Um, so that conference you can book uh, online at the Eventbrite site if you, if you Google the, the title. Um, but there's additionally, as well as the conference, going to be a public lecture that evening uh, after the conference uh, from 5 till 6.15. And that's going to be in honour of Robert Hind, who was the former master of St John's um, and an enormous inspiration for developmental research um, in Britain uh, and beyond. And the title for that uh, keynote at the end of the day is Development of Social Behaviour in Children from Infancy, Neurobiological, Relational and Situational Interactions. So two events that I think could be of real interest to people who have come today. Um, lastly, I just want to thank ever so much Jonathan Mant for agreeing to chair um, this event. Uh, Jonathan is the head of the primary care unit uh, and has been tremendously supportive to the Applied Social Sciences Group um, and to myself. Uh, since I arrived now uh, three years ago. Um, so a huge thank you to Jonathan for, uh, for all the support and for chairing today's event. Thank you, Robbie. And, and we'll... <laughs> and thank you very much for inviting me to, to chair it. Um, so I'm really looking forward to this evening. And uh, our uh, speaker tonight is uh, Professor Greg Miller. So welcome. Uh, Greg is co-director of the Foundation of Health Research Centre at the uh, Louis W. Menck... Now, ah, ah, I should have read this through before, shouldn't I? <laughs> Put my glasses on to uh, take this. Right. Uh, he, he's the Louis uh, W. Menck Professor at Northwestern University with appointments in the Department of Psychology, the Institute for Policy Research and the Department of Medical Social Sciences. Uh, and his research examines the behavioural and biological mechanisms through which stress affects health. And uh, today, uh, he's going to be talking to us around uh, childhood social disadvantage and physical health across the lifespan mechanisms and moderators. And this is part one. <laughs> so, uh, Greg, welcome. A heartfelt thank you to Robbie and Guy for inviting us. 
here to Cambridge and for arranging this fantastic trip and to the discussants for coming all this way to discuss the work. Um, we've so much enjoyed our 24 hours here. We're looking forward to the next couple of days, stimulating interactions and making some new friends. Um, so I'll go ahead and get started. Um, as noted, the talk's going to be about research on childhood social disadvantage and how it relates to physical health across the lifespan. Um, and as you've heard, this is a two-part talk. Um, so before I get started, I should just say that um, the two-part talk is going to be such that most of the work that Edith and I do, we do together. Um, and when the invitation from Robbie came, we were faced with this dilemma of how do we split up what is both of ours. Um, and the way we decided to split it up was that part one would be more about our research on mechanisms, which sort of implicitly assumes that social disadvantage has a causal influence on physical health and tries to understand what some of the proximal biological mechanisms explaining those disparities might be. Now this work assumes sort of an underlying main effects model where socially disadvantaged individuals experience certain biological changes that then in turn alter their vulnerability to health. And in the aggregate, we certainly believe that to be true. However, we also know from lots of research done here and elsewhere in our own work that that's not universal, that there are main effects, but they're weak by comparison to interactions, and that there are important moderators that afford some disadvantaged children protection and afford other children vulnerability. The second part of the talk tomorrow, which is the more optimistic and positive part of the talk, on moderators, Edith will deliver. And she'll spend a lot of time talking about the wrinkles and nuances and subtleties that I won't be able to address today because I'm focused more on this question of proximal mechanisms. So don't take my lack of discussion of those protective factors and resilience and moderators as anything, any having any implication about my beliefs about their existence. I think they're important. I think they really matter. It's just that you have to wait till tomorrow for the good part of the talk. Um, so with that said, um, I'm going to be talking today um, about what I think is maybe not a distinctly, but a particularly American view of social disparities in health. Um, and let me start by saying I realize that um, it's ironic in many ways that there's an American here at Cambridge discussing social disparities in health. All of the seminal research on social disparities was done here in Britain. Um, so much of what I'm saying today is simply derivative of that scholarship. Um, I appreciate that irony. Um, the other irony is, of course, that Americans have this founding mythology that we left Britain because it was too classist of a society and that we Americans don't have any such thing as social class or social divisions. But of course, as you'll see, we have created our own inequalities that are even grander in scale than um, those of the country from which we originated. So there are many ironies implicit in, in me being here today. Um, I'll stop now and we can talk about more later. Um, if you have questions, um, feel free to ask them. I think Robbie's correct in noting that lengthy, lengthy question or questions that are going to demand lengthy answers are probably best saved for the discussion period. But if you have questions that involve clarifications or elaborations, don't hesitate to jump in. I'm used to being interrupted. Um, so let me go ahead and get started um, and just give you a little bit of a sense of health disparities from an American perspective. Um, so how does America look um, relative to other wealthy countries? Well, if you want to know the answer to this question, there's this fantastic report authored by an Institute of Medicine panel a couple of years ago that compares the US to 17 other industrialized wealthy nations, most of them in Western Europe, but also Canada, Japan, Australia, New Zealand. Um, and what it finds is that we Americans are exceptional in many ways. Um, we believe ourselves to be. Um, everything I tell you isn't going to be particularly flattering in terms of exceptionality, though. So compared to our peer countries, um, we spend a much more sizable fraction of our gross domestic product on health care. Um, at the same time, we comparatively have shorter lives and we experience more disease and disability. Um, we are at the bottom of those 17 countries in terms of longevity, and at the top in terms of most diseases and most forms of disability. And we are a far outlier on top in terms of costs. Um, many people, many people in America in particular, believe 
that the health problems are concentrated in particular groups, particular racial ethnic groups and particular socioeconomic groups. Um, while it is true that health problems are more prevalent in those groups, they do not explain America's poor standing internationally in terms of health. So there have been fantastic studies, some of them led here by Michael Marmot's group, showing that if you compare Americans at the 75th percentile of the income distribution or the education distribution to their 75th percentile peers in other countries, particularly Britain, even highly affluent, highly edu educated Americans look worse on most health outcomes relative to their same social class peers elsewhere. So this report and the research doesn't paint a very flattering portrait of America um, in terms of health. Um, we also have much greater inequality in health outcomes than other countries. So the difference in many health outcomes between those at the lower and the higher ends of the socioeconomic distributions is a much more sizable difference in America than it is in say Canada, in Britain, New Zealand, Australia. Um, so one thing that people often ask me when I'm giving lectures like this to interdisciplinary audiences, why as a psychologist would you study health disparities? Isn't this the province of people in public health or in primary care or in sociology? How is this a psychological problem? Um, I think it's a fascinating psychological problem. Um, I don't think it's a problem that can be addressed effectively from any one disciplinary perspective. It really requires insights from across the social and the biomedical sciences. And in that regard, it's a perfect problem for psychologists because we straddle in many ways all of the disciplines that I think have something to add to this complex and pressing problem. We can really bring together biological and social perspectives in a way that many other disciplines aren't as able to do. We sit at that nexus. Um, so social disparities, are of course, a challenging mechanistic problem to understand from a scientific perspective. To do so, one has to go all the way from larger community level influences um, and structural institutional factors. And those topics are usually the province of sociologists and economists and political scientists and demographers. But that can't be the whole story. One also has to be able to take insights about structure and context and get them under the skin at the level of the way organs function and cells behave and genes get turned on and off. And that's more the province of physiology and clinical medicine. Um, so to do this problem justice, we have to be able to bridge that gap and bring those multiple levels of analysis together. And that makes it a very challenging problem, especially in today's world where the emphasis is really on deep, deep disciplinary expertise and siloing. Everything in the world of our journals, in the world of our granting agencies, in the world of our universities pushes us to go deeper and deeper, not broader and broader. Um, this is an exception. This is a problem that anybody working in this field recognizes requires multiple disciplinary perspectives. Um, as I said, this work is really at the nexus of different branches of academics, and that makes it very attractive to me. Um, and it has hugely important implications for well-being, for public health, for economic productivity, um, and perhaps for policy too. So all of these things make it a very attractive and compelling problem for a psychologist to study. Um, I'm gonna give you a quick overview of the two lectures right now. So today I'll give you a look at um, what American health disparities look like in contemporary US. Um, a little bit of a sense of how Edith and I approach the problem in our own research. Um, and give you a flavor of how we've been trying to unravel some of the proximal biological mechanisms through which social disparities may relate to health outcomes. As I said, tomorrow, Edith will be up here um, and she'll talk about what resilience looks like. Resilience being the idea that not all children who grow up in disadvantaged contexts turn out to have the health problems we're gonna discuss today. There's a fair bit of resilience um, and she's going to talk a lot about some of the psychosocial and familial contexts that are associated with positive outcomes in the context of disadvantage. Um, she's also going to talk about what resilience doesn't look like. Some of you may be familiar with recent work we've done looking at the health costs of social mobility, particularly for minorities in the U.S., and what sorts of health problems may accrue as a result of trying to transcend class and race lines. Um, and she'll talk about implications for interventions.
Um, so with that in mind, I'll go ahead and get started on today's topics. Um, so there are at least five very striking features of American health disparities today. Um, so the first is that they are present across the entire lifespan. So I could show you lots of different data. This one illustrates it nicely. So this is looking at um, neonatal mortality, so first 30 days of life, infant mortality, first year of life, as a function of maternal education. Um, and as you can see in this fairly recent slide from about a decade ago, um, both neonatal and infant mortality pattern in a very linear way according to maternal education, much higher rates of both for mothers who have less than a high school education, um, and I could take many other early life outcomes and, and show you fairly similar patterns. If we go to early and middle adulthood, this is an example of another health disparity. Here we're looking at um, the prevalence of diabetes in Americans who are age 20 to 64, and it's as a function of income, and here income is defined in relation to the federal poverty line. In America, the federal poverty line today for a family of four is about $24,000. That doesn't vary geographically, so whether you're living in New York City or in the middle of Iowa, it's about the same amount. Um, and it gains access to multiple government and social resources. So as you can see that families who are at the federal poverty line are low, or individuals have much higher prevalence of diabetes relative to their peers who were three to four times the federal poverty line. Again, a fairly linear gradient. And then if we take an outcome at the end of life, which is life expectancy, here we're looking at life expectancy um, at age 25, again, as a function of income relative to the poverty line, again, you see this clear gradient with um, about, at this point, five to six more years of life for people on the far right-hand side relative to the far left-hand side, or at least my right and left, not yours. Um, but the point is, is that increased income relative to poverty is related to, to greater longevity in contemporary America in a fairly strong way, as it is in, in many nations. Um, so besides these disparities being persistent across the lifespan, um, we see them not only between, but also within racial and ethnic groups. And this is important in the American context because there is a widespread belief that America's health problems relative to peer nations and many of America's health problems in general are concentrated in sub subset of racial and ethnic groups. There's a lot of belief that they're most common and most problematic in African Americans and in Latino populations and that there aren't true health disparities. But if we look at the data, um, it's the case that um, income and socioeconomic status more generally, whether it's looked at as educational or occupational prestige, is associated with health outcomes within each of these racial and ethnic groups. So you can see within blacks, within whites, and within Hispanics. Here we're looking at life expectancy at age 25. There's a clear gradient in longevity according, again, to income relative to poverty ratio. So this suggests that it's not just a black problem, it's not just a Hispanic problem, it is a socioeconomic problem that is present within groups. Now you can see that there are group differences as a whole, blacks have shorter lifespans in America than whites. Um, that's a very robust finding. That's partly because blacks have considerably less income and even considerably less wealth than whites do. Um, but there are other challenges for blacks in America too that have nothing to do with income and education that relate to health. And we'll talk about, Edith will talk about some of those more tomorrow. Um, so again, this is a, an issue within every racial and ethnic group. Um, these are graded roughly linear effects, so this won't come as any surprise to, to most people in Britain who have read the classic work on socioeconomic and status health here. Um, so this is um, looking at career earnings per household by decile and its life expectancy conditional on surviving to age 50. And it's really striking to me, even when you're looking by decile at how clearly linear this effect is. Um, this is min. And if you look all the way on the far left of the screen where you compare Americans in the ninth versus the 10th decile of household income. So we're talking about very affluent Americans here. We're talking about Americans in the ninth decile who have a household income north of $250,000 a year at least. And they still are living on average 
two to three years less than Americans in that 10th best cycle. Two to three years on average. That's a huge demographic effect. There's no question that at the ninth decile in America, you have plenty of access to good food, to health care, to all of the resources you could need. And yet, clearly, you're still at some disadvantage. So explaining the linearity of these effects at all levels is really a challenge. Um, it's a challenge everywhere. And you see the same thing in women, by the way. Um, clearly linear. The effects are a little bit less pronounced in women in, in this analysis than they are in men. Um, so they're graded, they're roughly linear. If you want more bad news, it's that these effects are getting larger or the social gradient is getting steeper as time goes on. So this is a recent analysis. Um, and what you're looking at here on the y-axis is the difference in life expectancy between Americans born in 1920 versus 1940. So the higher the number, the bigger the difference in life expectancy favoring those born in 1940, right? So these are basically generational differences. Blue is men and green is women. And what's striking about this figure to me is that um, almost all of the gains in longevity that happened between these two generations have benefited those in the upper half of the income distribution. So people born in 1920, shortly after World War I ended, versus people born in 1940, in the middle of World War II, grew up in vastly different public health environments in America. We saw dramatic changes in lifespan for these two generations, thanks to vaccination, thanks to sanitation, thanks to medicine. Um, and yet, if you look at folks in the bottom, say, three deciles, those benefits don't really accrue. We're talking about a couple of extra years of life on average, whereas up in the ninth and 10th percentile or deciles, you're looking at much, much larger gains. So these data and others suggest that if anything, as income and wealth inequality and educational inequality expand in our country, so do the gaps in long-term health outcomes. So now for some positive news. Um, these Socioeconomic gradients aren't destiny. Um, there's considerable heterogeneity in the strength of these gradients from community to community in America. So this is a map published by Raj Chetty's group a couple of years ago in JAMA. And what you're looking at here is life expectancy for Americans in the bottom income quartile by county. Um, and the darker the color gets, means the shorter the life expectancy. So in the darkest red regions, people in the bottom quartile live to about age 75 on average. In the lightest regions, they live to age 78 plus. So you're talking about a three plus year gap. Um, and what you can see is that there's tremendous variability across the country in your life expectancy if you're a low income American, tremendous three, four years on average. If you are a low income in American, you're much better off living in the West Coast, California, Oregon, Washington, or in the Northeast versus living in the industrial Midwest or living in the South. These data suggest to many of us that what happens in communities with policies, what happens in neighborhoods, what happens in families, has the potential to mitigate some of these larger trends that I've been showing you today. And that what we do in our neighborhoods and communities has the potential to really matter for the health and well-being of less fortunate Americans. So this is, this is a hopeful note. Um, the other striking thing, and this is where I'm gonna, I think, pivot a little bit more into our work specifically and away from the broader trends, is increasing evidence that childhood is an especially sensitive period for low socioeconomic status to set up adverse health trajectories across the lifespan. Um, again, I could show you lots of different slides depicting this association. Um, here's one that I find especially striking. Um, I apologize for the poor quality of the slide. This, these are data from the precursor study, which is a longitudinal cohort of physicians who graduated 
from Johns Hopkins Medical School in the 50s and 60s and 70s. Hopkins is among the top five medical schools in the United States. The elite of the elite physicians train there. Um, so everybody in this analysis is a physician by training. By virtue of that, they have high occupational prestige, high education, and quite high income relative to all Americans. So they are as high SES as you could potentially get in our country. And all that's been done here is to simply stratify them according to whether they had high or low SES as children. And this is stratified simply according to whether their father had a manual versus non-manual occupation. Again, a very crude measure of childhood SES. But even this crude measure, as you can see, differentiates these highly affluent and educated physicians in terms of their prognosis um, or their risk for coronary heart disease when they hit middle age. And of course, it favors those who grew up in more privileged backgrounds by virtue of their father having a non-manual occupation. These curves are adjusted for current income. There's not a ton of variability. Um, but I think what really is striking is that even in this group who by any estimate is high in social position, any estimate, there are still these lingering effects of childhood experience. There's also increasing evidence, um, probably less robust at this point, but intriguing and suggestive that the associate, that one's childhood socioeconomic conditions not only affect one's health during one's lifetime, but may be passed on to the next generation. Um, these are some data from one of our cohort studies. This is a study of pregnant women, um, about 700 across four different centers in the United States. And we simply looked at the level of material hardship during women's childhood and related it to their own birth outcomes. So we're looking at the likelihood that they delivered their own babies before 37 weeks gestation, the likelihood that the baby was small for gestational age, so this is below the 10th percentile, sex and age gestational age adjusted, and then the length of the baby's hospital stay. And what you can see is that all three of these outcomes pattern by the mother's amount of material hardship during her own childhood. And again, these graphs are adjusted for the mother's current socioeconomic status. So it's definitely the case that there's limited social mobility in America and that low-income children from families with limited education are most likely to become low-income adults with limited education themselves. But even when we statistically control for that lack of mobility here, there are still persistent associations suggesting that women's childhood experiences can potentially get passed through the next generation through gestational influences on the timing of birth and the baby's size at birth. And certainly from a health services perspective, women with the most disadvantaged childhoods have babies that spend on average four more days in the hospital than their peers from less disadvantaged um, childhoods. And those are almost all days in the neonatal intensive care unit. So when you do a cost analysis here, it's just an incredible amount of money that's being, uh, that's differentiating these women. Again, suggestive findings need to be followed up. We've also done some of this work in the context of asthma. In a cohort of asthma patients, we've studied in Chicago. These are all pediatric asthma patients between the ages of about eight and 17. We looked at the socioeconomic conditions of their parents when their parents were children. And we see on a number of different outcomes, looking at the amount of inflammation that's relevant to asthma, looking at the child's report of asthma control and the parent's report of asthma control, that children whose parents grew up low socioeconomic status have less well-controlled asthma and more dysregulated patterns of allergic inflammation than their peers. And again, this is independent of the current economic circumstances that the child is experiencing. It's independent of the parent's education. It's what happened to the mother in particular during the mother's childhood that drives these associations. So again, suggestive influences that there may be these lingering effects of childhood into the next generation. So 
um, I've shown you lots of different kinds of associations. Um, and you probably all have different explanations running through your minds right now. So let's talk about some of the possible explanations for the associations we've observed. Um, so one common explanation um, is that this is really all about bad genes. So there's always at least one or two people in the audience who want to talk about this when I give this when I give these sorts of lectures. And I think it's an important point to address. So the argument here goes something like this. Um, there is a sack of risk genes that aggregate within families, and those risk genes predispose both the parents and the kids to lots of bad stuff. The bad stuff includes not doing so well in school, getting a not so great job, having health problems, and maybe other things. And then what we're seeing here is not so much causal associations between social position and health outcomes, but genes with pleiotropic effects or genes that associate together and predispose whole families to lots of negative outcomes. So it's certainly a possible explanation. It could be part of the story. It's a hard alternative explanation to test because you can generate this hypothesis, but then coming up with the sack of genes and specifying what they are is a whole other thing, right? So um, we can't measure all the possible genetic variations in humans and statistically control for it or do analyses that stratify it by it. And that's what you need to do to really test this. What you can do is a couple of other things. So one is you can look to animal studies. So I saw that Steve Sumi is coming and giving a talk in a couple of weeks. Steve's work and work like it has shown that in non-human primate models and also in mouse models and in rat models, you can experimentally manipulate the amount of social disadvantage. It looks a little bit different than it does in humans, of course, because it's an animal model, but in the best plausible animal models, um, early life manipulations of social status and of resources um, do produce differential susceptibility to infectious disease, to asthma, to arthritis, to stroke, and to other health problems. So these animal models are certainly consistent with the plausibility of a causal explanation. You have to be careful about extrapolating from animal models of social disadvantage to human ones, but we make that extrapolation all the time in other branches of public health and medicine. So if we're comfortable doing it to understand the basic pathogenesis of disease or how a drug's going to work, then I think we should be equally comfortable doing it to understand social disparities. Um, the other thing you can do if you don't trust the animal models, which is a reasonable sense of mistrust, is you can look to natural experiments, so adoption studies. There are really nice adoption studies using linkage of administrative records. These have been done in multiple Northern European countries. Um, so you can look, for example, at babies who were adopted out of lower income families into higher income families on the day of birth um, and look at long term health outcomes, mortality records. And those sorts of studies generally converge on the conclusion that longevity, risk for heart disease, risk for stroke is a function of both the adoptive parents, which suggests an environmental role, and the birth parents, which suggests probably a genetic role, although possibly with some environment. So again, those data are consistent with the idea that this is unlikely to be purely a sack of bad genes sort of phenomenon, that it's quite likely that the environment plays a role. People often wonder how much of this is just about limited mobility. So these childhood SES findings that I've shown you, which are my focus for the rest of the talk, one sort of counter argument for interpreting them is that because there's such limited social mobility, maybe what you're seeing is low SES children grow up to be low SES adults, and we know that low SES adults have a whole plethora of health risks that's associated with low education and income. And maybe childhood isn't really a sensitive period. It just sets people up for different SES in adulthood. Um, again, this is certainly part of the story, especially in contemporary America, but it's not the whole story. The graph I showed you five slides back on physicians from Johns Hopkins shows that it can't be the whole story because even among highly affluent, highly educated physicians, there are differences by early social class. So it doesn't seem to be just about limited mobility. So it could also be that this is a causal effect of childhood SES, that what happens in childhood in terms of our socioeconomic conditions causally affects our health across the lifespan. Um, 
We don't know this to be true. I think when you put the different forms of evidence together from animal models and natural studies and observational studies, I think it strongly hints at a causal conclusion. Um, we need more of that kind of work to be sure and iron out the details. Assuming for the moment that this has some causal element to it, that genetics play a role for sure, that limited mobility play a role, but that there's some causal element. How could that happen? And that's really sort of the question that we try to tackle, that how, and what can be done about it. So how could this be causal? In particular, how could there be a causal relationship between early childhood social conditions and health outcomes that occur much later in the life course? Um, and here I'm particularly interested in things like risk for myocardial infarction and strike, stroke and some forms of cancer. So here we're trying to understand how you take an experience that occurs during the first decade of life um, and get it under the skin to affect organs and cells and molecules and then manifest five, six, seven decades later in a stroke or an MI. How do you bridge not only the social world to the biological world, but how do you bridge childhood to adulthood? How do you bridge multiple decades of life? How could that happen? Well, the first thing to understand in asking this question is that many of the diseases we associate with aging actually start in the early decades of life. And there's been a real paradigm shift in the past few decades in thinking about later life diseases in this manner. And this is particularly true in terms of cardiovascular disease and atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease. These are um, amazing figures from a study that was published in JAMA of about 2,000 autopsies done in the United States. Um, and what they've done here is produce maps of longitudinal sections of the abdominal aorta and the right coronary artery. And it's hard to see up here, I apologize. But the upper map is for about 515 to 19 year olds. The lower map is for about 830 to 34 year olds. So you're looking at people in the first few decades of life here in these two different sites. And the darker the color, the higher the prevalence of lesions documented histologically at these sites. Um, and the numbers here, I'm not going to go into detail. I think what's striking is how widespread atherosclerosis is um, in people who are between, say, 20 and 30. Um, if you just ask the question of what percentage of these autopsy cases had any lesion in, say, the right coronary artery, 50% of the 15 to 19-year-olds had an early stage atherosclerotic lesion in their right coronary artery. 100% did by age 30. Um, so this is a disease that clearly starts in the early decades of life. Whether these lesions go on to become clinically problematic in 40 years and lead to MIs, we can't say. Nobody's been able to do that kind of longitudinal work. But what we do know is that the pathological processes that ultimately cause people to have heart attacks, strokes, and other atherosclerotic clinical outcomes do originate in the early years of life. And that they have um, some, and this is also true in some animal models of other diseases associated with aging, in particular some forms of cancer, some autoimmune conditions. The, the strongest story is for sure in cardiovascular disease. Um, and that many of these conditions associated with aging also have common pathogenic mechanisms. Um, I'm going to be talking a lot in the rest of the talk about inflammation as such a mechanism. Um, this idea introduced by Peter Nathan of non-resolving inflammation, this low-grade chronic inflammatory response that's present in multiple tissues in the body, is clear in animal models as a pathogenic contributor to lots of the diseases that cause much of the public health burden in developed countries around the world, ranging from atherosclerosis to some cancers, cardiometabolic diseases, asthma. Um, and our work is focused a lot on how socioeconomic position might relate to inflammation 
and how those inflammatory processes in turn acting in concert with other environmental and genetic risks might shape health outcomes down the line. Um, and many of these processes, in particular inflammation, um, pattern by exposures, which themselves pattern by socioeconomic status. So a lot of our work has been trying to explain how do you get to this non-resolving inflammation from a low SES context. And we have lots of conceptual work that has sort of given us a roadmap to understand how that might be. Um, and a very active part of our work and others' work is trying to understand how you go again from something like socioeconomic status and get it under the skin through experiences, um, through development. Um, and we have um, sort of two sets of hypotheses that I think bridge fairly competing but actually complementary views of how this could happen. So one set of hypotheses grow out of the kind of classic David Barker ideas about early life programming. And the idea here is that experiences related to socioeconomic status, both social experiences, what sorts of caregiving one receives, what sorts of major adverse childhood experiences one has, diet, infection, that those sorts of things early in life may change cells in ways that have long-lasting, not so malleable programming or conditioning sorts of effects. And that could happen via epigenetic mechanisms, although it doesn't have to happen via epigenetic mechanisms. So we think it's likely that there are some programming sorts of effects like Barker talks about, and there's good animal evidence um, of that, particularly in rats, but also some of Sumi's later monkey work shows that. Um, but we, we don't think, and I don't think anybody today really strongly believes that there are these open and shut windows for programming and that your first few years of life are destiny. Um, we also know as developmentalists that what happens in the early years of life um, in terms of our interactions with our caregivers, in terms of the social environment we grow up in, in terms of exposure to stressors related to poverty, that those early experiences shape who we become. They shape what we like and what we dislike. They shape how we relate to the social world. They shape how we engage with other people, how we evaluate risk, how we evaluate reward, and how we pursue it. And those things across the lifespan span continue to be very important for our health. It's not that what happens in childhood only matters because it happens in childhood and affects the biology in a destiny way, in a way that's fixed destiny. What happens in childhood affects the people we become, and the people we become continue to influence our life, um, our health across the lifespan. Um, so our thinking is sort of encapsulated in some ways by that last slide and this slide. Um, and this slide, I think, will, will set you up a little bit for the data that are to come. Um, and what we've hypothesized over the years um, in a very oversimplified way is that growing up in a disadvantaged environment increases the likelihood that children across the lifespan will have this pro-inflammatory phenotype that contributes to that non-resolving inflammation and the idea here is that early disadvantage sets up these cells, which in their immature form are called monocytes, and in their mature form are called macrophages, to be more responsive to microbial threats um, and less sensitive to signals that inhibit the response to those threats. Basically, We'll talk about this in a little more detail in the next few slides. The hypothesis is that through the set of experiences that are correlated with disadvantage, both the social experiences and the physical experience, these cells basically become more pro-inflammatory and less sensitive to inhibitory signals. And that in a cumulative way across the years and across the decades, that contributes to more of the kind of non-resolving inflammation that Nathan and others' work suggests contributes to chronic diseases related to aging. So a very brief primer on inflammation that's going to help you understand some of the slides to come. So this is sort of the canonical inflammatory response. Is there a pointer anywhere here? No. Oh, perfect. Thanks. All right. Excellent. 
by player, which is good. So this is a cell, this is a monocyte. Monocyte expresses on its surface this molecule called TLR4. And what TLR4 does is recognize this molecule here called LPS, also known as endotoxin. And LPS is found on the surface of gram-negative bacteria. Um, when the monocyte recognizes the presence of LPS, it knows that gram-negative bacteria are in the vicinity, and the signaling cascade begins. And you don't need to know the details of this signaling cascade. What's important to know is that when these gram-negative bacteria are recognized, this molecule right here, called nuclear factor kappa B, NF kappa B, this is pivotal. This is kind of the linchpin of the monocyte macrophage inflammatory response. This guy moves into the nucleus and it switches on the genes that code for pro-inflammatory cytokines and chemokines and other mediators, the inflammatory response. Um, and what we're gonna do in a bunch of experiences, is we're gonna take cells from adults and kids, we're gonna activate them with LPS, and we're gonna look at how much of this accumulates and how much of these pro-inflammatory cytokines and mediators accumulate and try and understand what socioeconomic status does to change this signaling cascade. So that's how this basic inflammatory response gears up. These molecules allow cells to communicate with each other. They allow cells at the site of the injury and infection to call other cells to the site, to start proliferating, to start remodeling tissue, healing wounds, eradicating whatever sort of pathogen may be present. So how does this all get regulated? Of course, inflammation is a really important and critical response for survival. Without it, basic infections, basic injuries and wounds would kill us. You need it, but you also need to turn it off because as we discussed earlier in the talk, this non-resolving inflammation at a low level has a cost at the other end. So you want to be able to start it up and then turn it off. How does it start up and turn off? There are multiple anti-inflammatory signals in the body that kind of turn off this response. One of the most powerful ones that's harnessed clinically too is through glucocorticoids. So cortisol, the way it acts is by the hormone crosses the cell membrane, binds to this glucocorticoid receptor in the cytosol of the cell. And what that complex does is tie up NF-kappa B. It prevents NF-kappa B from going into the nucleus and switching on these pro-inflammatory genes. This complex also makes its way into the nucleus and turns on other anti-inflammatory genes. But basically, it's a roadblock that prevents these genes from getting switched on. So this is why when you go to the pharmacy and you get some topical hydrocortisone for your rash, um, or if you take a steroid inhaler for your asthma, there's less inflammation because glucocorticoids are blocking this among other inflammatory pathways. And we're gonna model this in vitro by activating kids' cells with LPS and then adding glucocorticoids to see how good of a job it does suppressing that response. So our early work on this was a little over 10 years ago and we simply asked the question of if this non-resolving inflammation and this pro-inflammatory phenotype um, is related to social disadvantage, we should see it in a simple associational study. Um, so in this work, we focused on a small group of healthy young adults, and they were recruited here to be high or low in early childhood SES, so focusing on the first five years of life. Um, and because early and later SES are so tightly intertwined um, in North America, we matched each of the subjects on their current SES too. So um, we made sure through design that we could isolate the effects of early SES from later SES um, on a case-by-case -case matching strategy. Um, and here we're defining SES according to occupational prestige. So for childhood SES, um, we took each of our participants and we got in touch with their parents and asked about the parents' education and income and occupation when their child was born. And using um, occupational coding schemes produced here in the UK, we were able to code um, people's parents as having high or low occupational prestige. We did the same thing for the participants' current SES. And the figures I'm gonna be showing you are all adjusted for these particular covariates, which you imagine might associate with SES and also associate with inflammation and other health outcomes. 
So everything I'm showing you is net of these demographic variables and these lifestyle variables here. So the first thing we did is um, take people's cells and activate them in a test tube or in vitro um, with different sorts of microbial stimuli that start this inflammatory response in monocytes. And then we measured 24 hours later production of these inflammatory mediators. We're looking at interleukin-6 here, but we've seen the same pattern with other ones. So here are some examples of what we found. So this is stimulating um, the TLR3 pathway, um, which responds to double-stranded RNA viruses. This is stimulating the TLR5 pathway, which responds to flagellin, um, was present on most bacterial species. And what we see in these two examples, as well as many others, is that young adults who come from more disadvantaged backgrounds produce more of this pro-inflammatory cytokine IL-6 in culture compared to their more privileged peers. And again, this is net of demographic variables like age and sex and race and ethnicity. It's net of lifestyle variables like smoking and adiposity and exercise. And it's net of current occupational prestige. Again, so some early evidence in our work suggesting that growing up in more disadvantaged environments is associated with a larger in vitro response. We've done many subsequent studies replicating and extending these findings. We see it with other microbial stimuli as well as other danger signals that cells receive from their neighbors conveying information that there's been cell death or hypoxia. Um, that the monocytes and macrophages of adults who come from low SES childhoods tend to have larger inflammatory responses to these sorts of danger and microbial signals. And you see it not only with IL-6, but also with IL-1 and TNF-alpha, the other classic pro-inflammatory cytokines. This is a quite reproducible finding in our hands. Um, we also, in addition to this, um, let me step back. You might be thinking, well, isn't this larger response here good, right? So if, you, um, if your respiratory cells are faced with bacteria or virus or your intestinal cells, you might want them to make more inflammatory cytokines and rid you of that pathogen sooner. Um, and I would say, yes, that might be quite an adaptive response in the short term. The argument here is that um, over the long term, there may be a cost to that response being larger and perhaps excessive. And the focus here is really on the cumulative accrual of those inflammatory mediators and what that means for health. Um, to get a better sense of what's happening inside the cells and those signaling pathways that I showed you on the earlier cartoon of the canonical inflammatory response, we did some transcriptional profiling. So this is where we extract RNA from cells and we can measure the expression of about 25,000 different genes, all the known and well annotated human genes. And that gives us a real clear sense of which of these signaling pathways is relatively turned up and relatively turned down according to social position. Um, and what we see in this sort of bioinformatic analysis, this is a great example of how you can take 25,000 different genes and break them down into three outcomes and solve a big type one error problem. Um, here we're looking at expression of genes that have a response element for NF-kappa B. If you'll remember, NF-kappa B is that linchpin of the inflammatory response. It's the transcription factor that goes into the nucleus and switches on genes that code for cytokines and chemokines and other inflammatory mediators. And what you can see is that the cells of those subjects who come from more disadvantaged childhoods tend to have a higher, higher expression of genes with NF-kappa B response elements. So even when those cells are at rest, these are not stimulated cells, those inflammation responsive genes are working. Those signaling pathways are turned on even when the cells are in a relatively quiescent state and they're turned on to a greater extent or primed to a greater extent in those who come from more disadvantaged childhoods. Again, this is net of demographics, lifestyle, and current SES. What's relatively downregulated, by contrast, in young adults who come from more disadvantaged childhoods are genes that have response elements for the glucocorticoid receptor. And if you remember, the glucocorticoid receptor 
is what sits in the cytosol and binds cortisol and keeps NF-kappa B in that inflammatory response sequestered, right? So this is the regulatory or anti-inflammatory pathway that we talked about a few slides back. This is relatively down-regulated in subjects who come from more disadvantaged backgrounds. The implication to us being that the gas pedal of inflammation is slightly more on in those from disadvantaged backgrounds, NF-kappa B being the gas pedal, and GR being the brakes is not pushed on as strongly. So you have this net activation of pro versus anti-inflammatory gene expression here. Um, the developmentalists in the room might say, okay, those are young adults, great. Um, what do we know about kids? When does this evolve? Um, and um, what does it look like across development? This is some work we did, longitudinal study we did in nine-year-olds. So this was work we did um, with colleagues in Manitoba, one of the Canadian provinces, where in a longitudinal study, we were able to track children's socioeconomic status from birth um, using the size of their home, which in Manitoba is a great indicator of wealth as a measure of social class. And we could identify multiple trajectories of social class um, in these kids. Um, and then at age nine, when they were old enough to let us, we collected blood and did some of these same experiments I've been showing you. And what you see here is that we have five social class groups identified, standard, low, middle, high, um, middle, high, and then increasing. These are families whose SES increased over the course of children's development. And at age nine, we collected blood and we activated monocytes in culture. Again, with here it's LPS, this endotoxin, and looked at production of IL-6. And what you can see here is that there's this fairly linear effect here where the greatest in vitro inflammatory response is coming from those children who had persistently low social class across nine years of childhood. And it's a fairly linear effect down to here. And then those children whose families had high increasing social status over time. So um, they looked most similar to those who were stably high. Um, so this could be more of a recency effect as opposed to an early life effect. The point is, is that already by age nine, you can start to see differences in the way people's cells behave as a function of their family's socioeconomic conditions. Um, so we've puzzled for a long time, or we did puzzle for a long time, about how to take this further back developmentally. Um, and we didn't come up with a good solution because collecting blood from three and four and five year olds is quite a logistical headache that we weren't willing to endure or able to endure. And then we moved to Chicago about five years ago and we started to collaborate by accident um, with some obstetricians. And they said, oh, you can just study this at birth. You wanna know about children's function? So we started to get into studies looking at um, inflammation at the maternal fetal interface during gestation. And this is a newer line of work. Um, so in this slide over here, um, you have a diagram of the placenta. Um, and as most of you know, the placenta is the interface between the developing fetus and the mother. It's where nutrient gas exchange and waste exchange occurs. Um, look at that. Um, that's great. And um, a, lot of that ex <laughs> a lot of that exchange occurs right here in this chorionic villus layer, right? So there are these villus trees here that are actually fetal tissue and maternal blood comes from the maternal side in through these spiraling arteries and ends up in this inner villus space and oxygen and nutrients are transported through these villi to the fetus through the umbilical cord and fetal waste carbon dioxide are transported out um, and so this villus layer here is really critical for exchange, again, of nutrients, gases, waste between mom and baby. And during some pregnancies, um, there is inflammation in the placenta, and it can occur um, on the maternal side, it can occur in the villus layer, it can occur in the membranes, it can occur anywhere. Um, but that inflammation can be triggered by viral infections. We think it can be triggered also by stressful experiences. 
Um, it can be triggered by bacterial infections. And when it's severe enough, the inflammation can interfere with those nutrient and gas transfer functions. And what you see over here are two slides um, of um, chorionic villus layers that um, are more and less healthy. So the top slide, which is at um, lower magnification, shows you basically a cross section of a healthy villus tree. And what you'll see is here are these villi, and the white area here is the inner villus space, and you can see a lot of maternal red blood cells. And in these healthy intact villi, what you can see is very few blue purple cells that have infiltrated, and you can see large number of red spots, which are fetal capillaries, which take up maternal nutrients and oxygen. In the bottom slide here, which is higher resolution, you can see a mix. So these arrows here are pointing to healthy villi. Um, but adjacent to them is this asterisk, which shows um, a villus tree with substantial amount of infiltration by immune cells. And that infiltration has not only caused cells to accumulate in space where they normally shouldn't be, but it's also obliterated a bunch of the fetal capillaries and in the process reduced perfusion. Um, with potential implications for fetal nutrient delivery and oxygen delivery. Um, and we have started to do studies now asking whether these differences in socioeconomic status across the lifespan relate to the extent of inflammation in these different compartments of the placenta and particularly in this villus layer. There's also a parallel line of research that shows that these inflammatory lesions in this region here in particular are related to multiple aspects of neurodevelopment, at least in animal models. So um, there's lots of interest in, in this work, not only by us and others. And what we find, um, distressingly but perhaps not surprisingly, is that even in utero, exposure to inflammation varies by socioeconomic conditions. So this is a simple measure of maternal income and here we're looking at the prevalence of chronic inflammatory lesions anywhere in the placenta. And as you can see, there's a graded linear relationship where the lowest income women in this sample are about twice as likely to have an inflammatory lesion documented histologically by a perinatal pathologist relative to the higher income women. Now, almost all of these are low-grade lesions. We don't see a lot of really high-grade lesions that would give you serious clinical pause, but it does show that there is more activation of these inflammatory processes at the lower end of the income distribution. We've also done some work where we biopsy the placentas and do these gene expression studies in the placenta to try and understand how different signaling pathways related to inflammation and related to fetal growth are turned on or off relative to socioeconomic position. And those studies reveal, again, more patterns consistent with the same sort of conclusions, um, is that if we look at our more versus our less socioeconomically disadvantaged moms, the more disadvantaged moms show expression, greater expression of gene expression networks that are involved in immune activation. So these are networks that tell us about the activation of monocytes and lymphocytes, classic kind of pro-inflammatory pathways. Um, and disadvantaged moms' placentas also show less expression of gene networks that support fetal development. So um, again, we're not looking at the fetus per se here. We're looking at the placenta, but the placenta, particularly the villus layer, does produce a number of growth factors that support multiple aspects of fetal growth and fetal organ development. And what we're seeing is that the placentas of disadvantaged moms do less of that in these particular pathways involved in cardiac and neural development. Um, so these findings make us think that even from quite early stages in the lifespan in utero, their differences in production of and exposure to inflammatory mediators that pattern by socioeconomic conditions. Um, does any of this matter for clinical outcomes? And here's where I think the talk gets a little more tenuous. We see 
many, many connections between socioeconomic conditions um, and immunologic and hormonal outcomes that we think play a role in the initiation or the maintenance of disease. But are these fluctuations in biology of the magnitude or the duration that they affect clinical outcomes? And that's a tougher question to answer. Um, and when we look at that question, I'll give you a flavor for a couple of the ways we tried to address it. But um, I, I think that's where we're still a bit uncertain. Um, so in this earlier study I showed you that looked at pregnant women and their level of childhood disadvantage, I told you about these results where women who had high levels of disadvantage in childhood were more likely to deliver preterm and deliver babies of their own who were small for GA. So we measured inflammation in um, these women during the second and third trimesters of pregnancy. Um, so you can see IL-6 levels here vary according to childhood hardship. And when you do the mediation analyses, trying to see whether variations in childhood hardship relate to variations in inflammation during gestation, and do those in turn relate to variations in birth outcomes, the answer is, uh, this was all supposed to go together, but it's only one. The answer is, Yes, um, <laughs> yes, that, that part of the association between childhood hardship and preterm delivery is explained by women with childhood hardship having high levels of gestational inflammation. It's not the whole story. It turns out that it's about 20% of that association is explained by inflammation. Other things that explain it are that women who grow up with hardship are more likely to have gestational diabetes. They're more likely to have preeclampsia. They're more likely to have high blood pressure. They're more likely to have bacterial infections. So there are multiple pathways. We wouldn't expect inflammation to be the only one. We tend to think of it as one of the common pathways and perhaps one of the more final common pathways. But it explains part of this association. It doesn't explain any of the differences we see in birth weight or in small for GA. It really seems to be more of a pathway to timing of delivery rather than fetal growth. We've also looked at this in the context of depression with a focus on psychiatric disorders. So this is a study where um, we followed adolescents across two and a half years every six months um, assessing inflammatory markers, depressive symptoms, and we have a host of measures on early adversity, particularly socioeconomic adversity. And what we find in that work is a less clear kind of A, B, C mediation story, but interesting interactions and patterning. So in this sort of work, what we're doing is looking at participants who never across the two and a half years converted from being non-depressed to being depressed. Um, and looking at people who did convert, but at the time we're showing you their inflammation levels hadn't had a recent episode of depression, and then showing you another group of subjects who basically converted into a depressive episode within the past month of the time we collected blood um, as a function of childhood adversity. And what you can see here in an otherwise overly complicated graph is that when people have a recent episode of depression, their level of inflammation goes up um, compared to an earlier assessment where they were not depressed and had never been depressed previously. Um, but that the size of that gain in inflammation varies by the amount of socioeconomic adversity they experience during childhood. These are adolescents between 16 and 19. So you can see that the red group has two or more forms of disadvantage or did in childhood. And you can see that their change in inflammation is more sizable um, both for CRP and IL-6 relative to their peers. So there seems to be this added risk of inflammation when you get depressed if you simultaneously have socioeconomic disadvantage. Now the depressions here aren't qualitatively different along social class lines. So if we look at their duration, if we look at the symptom portraits, if we look at use of different therapies, that doesn't differ at all by adversity. Um, and that increased inflammation um, actually presages or forecasts subsequent vulnerability to later depressive episodes. Um, so this is looking at IL-6 levels of marker inflammation at a particular time point and then saying, 
six months later, what are the odds that people are going to be moving from a non-depressed state into a clinically depressed state? And again, you can see that inflammation is associated most strongly with a risk for depression than those with more forms of adversity. Something's talking to me. I think that means I should be done. Am I? No? Okay. All right. I will head towards finishing up. Um, we've also done a fair amount of work in asthma, um, and this is um, probably the pediatric condition where, at least in the United States, there are the most um, well-characterized and pronounced disparities, not so much in asthma incidence, um, that is less patterned by SES, but in terms of asthma control and um, things like hospitalization, functional limitations. So I can show you some of these slides quickly. So these aren't our data, but um, these are from other studies, just looking at missed school days, hospitalization, emergency department visits by social class, and you can see they all pattern. Um, quite clearly. Um, so one of the main foci of our research over the past few years has been trying to understand how these work um, and some of the same pathways that I've been talking about are, are relevant here, although in asthma these monocytes and macrophages are probably less relevant than other immune cells like T cells and B cells um, which generate a lot of the airway inflammation that leads to asthma symptoms, so we focus more on those cells um, and what we see consistently in that work is that um, low-income youth with asthma um, produce a lot more of these cytokines, both type 1 and type 2 cytokines, that lead to airway inflammation than their more affluent peers do. And this isn't just about their disease being more severe. When you control for their lung function, when you control for their symptoms, um, these disparities persist. There seems to be something different about the way these cells function in lower income versus higher income kids, even though all of them have asthma. Um, and the other thing we find is going back to this story about, um, <laughs> going back to this story about glucocorticoids and their importance. So um, we talked earlier about this idea that cortisol plays an important regulatory role in keeping inflammation in check. Um, and that is very true physiologically um, in asthma and other conditions that endogenously produce cortisol is an important regulator of, of airway inflammation. But also, as many of you know, glucocorticoids are, are kind of a mainstay of asthma therapy and asthma control for kids and adults. Um, and that, in fact, many people think about asthma severity being graded mostly on the lines of how effective glucocorticoids are in controlling them. And there's a, there's a sizable and troubling fraction of kids with asthma who are fairly unresponsive to glucocorticoids, taking away one of the most powerful and important clinical tools that, that physicians have to control asthma. And so we've really tried to ask this question of, does that impairment of glucocorticoid signaling that we've seen in other contexts actually show up in asthma too? And the short answer to that question is yes, that in kids with asthma, we actually see that not only does SES relate to more production of these inflammatory cytokines that light up the airways, but it also seems to diminish how sensitive those cells are to the anti-inflammatory signals that glucocorticoids send. Um, so it may turn out that there's less physiologic regulation and the clinical tools just aren't as effective because the cells aren't hearing that glucocorticoid message. I think that's about all I've got to say. I'm going to just stop here. Um, I think I said more than enough and um, acknowledge the, the fantastic collaborators um, and the supportive funders um, who have all made this work possible. Um, as I said earlier, um, this is... Um, not the most inspiring part of the talk. There's more optimism and hope and subtlety and nuance coming tomorrow. Um, you definitely should show up for the better half of the talk. Um, but in the meantime, I want to thank you for being such a patient audience, and um, I'm happy to take questions. Um, thanks. So uh, thank you, Greg, for that uh, real uh, tour de force. I mean, you, you said at the introduction to your talk that you'd be uh, uh, that it was very much an interdisciplinary um, uh, topic. Uh, 
Uh, and, and I think you, you demonstrate that very uh, nicely by giving us a very erudite coverage of the, the epidemiology of, of uh, socioeconomic status and, and health in the US, and, and then went on to the basics sort of pathophysiological mechanisms and, and, and your own work on uh, inflammation. So, so thanks very much. It's not often that you, you, we, we, you get in the same talk as of scholarly work on both the, the epidemiology and, and, and the basic pathophysiology. So, so thank you very much for that indeed. Um, so the, the process from uh, here now is we, we, we're going to ask a couple of uh, discussants to um, talk about, um, to, re to respond to your, your, your lecture, and uh, uh, th th then we'll be able to uh, ask people to ask questions after the two discussants have, uh, have spoken. So the um, uh, first discussant, well, we've seen her, 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 her picture already, uh, so, uh, and so she's uh, uh, welcome uh, Marion Backerman. Um, Kranenberg, who's professor at the uh, Centre for Child Health and Family Studies at Leiden University. And uh, her uh, research addresses epigenetics, neuroendocrinology, uh, as well as behavioural processes in the study of parenting and child uh, development. And I guess we'll be hearing a lot more about that in your, your Bradford Hill seminar in, in May. Um, and, and her work has contributed to the differential uh, susceptibility model, uh, showing that uh, children who are more susceptible to environmental influences are not only vulnerable to risk, but also thrive in supportive environments. Uh, so, Marion, over to you. Thank you. Thank you for your introduction. Thank you, Robbie and Guy, for bringing us together in this wonderful uh, symposium. Thank you uh, for this great presentation with many f fascinating questions. And thanks to the technicians who not only solved this light problem, but much more today, so that uh, this presentation is visible for you too. Yes, when Ma Marinas and I were on the train yesterday from, from London uh, to, uh, to Cambridge, for we decided to come by train rather than by plane, um, we were sitting opposite a family, and um, I do not know what you do to your trains, but every now and then there was a big noise, like boom, uh, like something exploding, actually. And we thought at this family, and they sat down, and they did not blink an eye, they did not raise an eyebrow. So we said, that's the typical British temperament. They went about their business during the Blitz. They are not afraid of any terrorist attack now. Um, th this is typically British. It turned out that this typical British family was our speaker of today and tomorrow. <laughs> <this summer. laughs> so <laughs> you fit very well in this <laughs> British environment indeed. Um, what I'll do uh, in my commentary now is uh, not give answers, perhaps raise more questions, but given our uh, uh, background in child and family studies, uh, I'll dig somewhat deeper into some of the issues related to the childhood social disadvantage relationships with physical health. And I'll focus on who are particularly affected and what can be done. Um, I was fascinated to see this uh, slide showing that the association between adult life expectancy, um, how that's affected by, by SES, is similar for the different ethnicity groups. Although in the background I wondered how many are actually black in the group uh, that earns four times more than the federal poverty line. How many blacks are represented in that rich, in that affluent group compared to the group of whites who earn so much? And that might be uh, uh, quite uh, a different proportion of the blacks than of the whites. And um, I was also brought to that thought because of a recent publication of the, the group of Chetty in actually this month of publications that, that show that uh, here you see two pictures uh, for the whites and for the blacks of the offspring of parents who are at a 25th percentile. What do their offspring have an, uh, for income? So the upward mo mobility. And what we see for whites, here for white uh, uh, males, is that the upward mobility is quite visible in the, the top half of this diagram, 
the darker green the better and they are well represented whereas for black offspring of parents of the 25th percentile the worse the it is the redder the, the darker red the worse it is in the lower half of this uh, picture shows that there is not much uh, upward mobility in black families it is in white families but not in the black families meaning that the the small percentage of blacks in the high income group um, is going on is continuing over generations what might be family factors associated with this lack of upward mobility with this being restricted to poverty neighborhoods for generation after generation and we know that that, that has certain um, implications for children's health this over generation continuity of, uh, of poverty what you see here is census tracts by poverty share and father presence so this is for neighborhoods for counties what is poverty uh, is here defined as a poverty rate that lower than 10 percent uh, in the poverty rate is for low poverty uh, tracts for low poverty neighborhoods um, the others are in the high poverty high father presence is that uh, more than 50 percent of the families in that neighborhood have the father present and what we find is here on the left hand side of this uh, this picture is that in uh, the black neighborhoods father absence is quite prevalent father presence is very low so low father presence is very prevalent in high poverty black neighborhoods whereas low father presence in white poor neighborhoods is quite low so uh, a really um, big difference in father presence for blacks and whites father absence is much more prevalent in black families in addition to that it seems especially detrimental to black boys if we compare them with white boys what you see here is on the x-axis the percentage of black children with the father present black children and white children actually boys both is that their um, uh, participation in the working force is for white boys higher than for black boys but for white boys much more independent of father presence than for black boys the regression coefficient is almost zero for white boys whereas it is clearly there for black boys so for black boys it's much more important that their father is present at the same time their father is present quite less often if we compare it within black families um, whether it does more whether it's more predictive of females daughters participating in the workforce versus boys participating in the in the workforce we see that for the females who participate in workforce anyway somewhat more than than for the boys again for females it does not make that much of a difference whether their father is present than it makes a difference for boys so again boys are more vulnerable black boys are more vulnerable to the absence of their father that's no direct answer to the question of why uh, there's no upward mobility, but it may uh, clarify some of the process. Of course, the consequences for their health, the biological mechanisms, uh, it's not directly informative on that too. And I think that's one of the things that are questions for future research. In fact, if we look at the covariates correlated with uh, black male income and the black white gap, black father presence is a very important one so it's really predictive of whether the black white gap is closed or not related but a little bit different factor is the stress factor in the family it's related because the absence of a father is of course uh, stress to a family too being a single parent is a heavy job 
And here I thought it might be of interest to present um, uh, some results from the NRCHD study on parenting and child development that started in the 90s, uh, where we did some study on the influence of ethnicity, poverty, stress for parenting and child development. What is striking in this, uh, in this data set is that attachment security uh, measured at around two years of age and telling you something about the emotional stability, the emotional health of the children, is much lower in black children than in white children. Now, attachment security is usually related to maternal sensitivity, to caregiving sensitivity. It reflects the interaction history that the child has in the first few years, whether the parent reacts sensitively to the infant needs. And rather than being uh, insecure, something that is in, in the genes of certain ethnic groups more than in other ethnic groups, it is indeed related to sensitivity in both white and black families. And what we found was that maternal sensitivity was indeed also substantially lower in black families than it was in white families. So that in both groups we found ethnicity related to sensitivity and sensitivity predictive of attachment security. But that's only part of the story. In fact, the mediator, uh, an important mediating factor was income. If you look at the uh, effect sizes, the effect size for the association between ethnicity and income, a uh, correlation of 0.65 is really impressive. That means that these are almost non-overlapping distributions of income and the, 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 the much lower income that is related to being African-American uh, is correlated with higher stresses, with much more stresses, higher levels of stress, which negatively impacts on maternal sensitivity, which then shows an association with attachment security. So that makes us wonder whether, apart from uh, emotional health, there may be other child outcomes that are related to maternal sensitivity or to attachment, for that matter. And these may include health outcomes. And for uh, some findings on the association between uh, maternal sensitivity and attachment security and later health outcomes, I'll turn to Generation R, a study in the Netherlands with a prospective cohort design starting from early fetal life, including almost 10,000 mothers and their children with more detailed measures in a uh, focus cohort that uh, includes somewhat more than a thousand families. Uh, and that's based in Rotterdam, a uh, urban uh, multi-ethnic population in the western part of the Netherlands. An industrial city, so uh, not the best quality of air either. So interesting for those who uh, have a focus on asthma and wheezing too. An overview of the design and the assessments. It starts uh, prenatal, as I said, with ultrasound measures. Then blood is taken from mother, father and child. Questionnaires are, are administered to uh, the family, also to teachers on child behavior. Uh, child cognition is measured and MRI is done at the age of seven and age of nine years uh, to measure brain structural and functional development. And here's Henning Thiemeyer, one of the principal investigators with whom we did a lot of this work. Um, as a first outcome, I'll focus on cortisol. Cortisol is a good thing, as we saw in, uh, in uh, Professor Miller's presentation, um, but also a bad thing if there is an overreaction, if there is too much of cortisol. It's good in the short term, but not in the long term to have high levels of cortisol. Um, we related lifetime depression of the mothers to cortisol reactivity during the strain situation. That is a brief observational setting where a child is separated from the caregiver, which elicits stress, also attachment behavior, but gives some stress. And the stress response can be seen from an increase in cortisol, from cortisol reactivity. What we found was a double risk for children with an insecure attachment 
and maternal depression. They had the highest levels of cortisol reactivity to this grief separation from the caregiver. At the same time, in a similar vein, um, the polymorphism of the uh, FKPP5 allele that is related to the cortisol system also showed an effect in combination with uh, attachment. Those with an insecure attachment, insecure resistant attachment relationship with their caregiver and with two T alleles showed the highest levels, the strongest cortisol reaction to this brief stressful episode. For asthma and uh, allergic reactions, we found that sensitivity is a buffer for the bad air condition in some parts of, uh, of Rotterdam. And this is uh, taking into account differences in social economic status, income, uh, educational level. Sensitivity buffers the, the uh, development of asthma and wheezing over time. More sensitivity gives less wheezing over time in this longitudinal design. So we know now that attachment and uh, sensitivity um, do matter for uh, some of these outcomes, for stress reactivity, in terms of cortisol, for health. So we've seen two outcomes that it affects. Uh, we wondered whether it uh, might also affect brain development, structural brain development in children. We do know that in extreme environments, such as uh, orphanage study, brain morphology is damaged by the uh, total lack of stable attachment figures, stable care that is taken of children who grow up in institutional care. But we wondered whether that is only in extreme environments or whether even parental sensitivity in a normal range has consequences for child brain development. So we observed parental sensitivity uh, three times during a toddlerhood at one, three and four years old and at nine observed brain uh, structure, both in terms of total brain volume and gray-white matter. Uh, and we found that indeed parental sensitivity was associated in normal fa families with cortical thickness in specific brain areas. And also these uh, results were controlled for SES income and education. So even normal variation in early parental sensitivity predicts child structural brain development. In some, childhood socioeconomic disadvantage is related to physical health. I think we all are convinced after all the examples that we saw in the uh, inspiring lecture that we just heard. But buffering factors may be father presence and maternal sensitivity. So these are things that we can promote. Um, there are several ways to promote uh, uh, parenting sensitivity. One of them that, that we know quite well is a video intervention program that we've been developing over the years that seems to work in uh, 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 various samples in promoting caregiving sensitivity that in and of itself does not yet answer the question uh, whether it would affect parents, uh, a father's sensitivity, paternal sensitivity as well. The only thing I could say is that we are currently even um, uh, trying out a study where we use it with fathers, the video feedback intervention, during, uh, using ultrasounds. So even prenatally starting to let grow, uh, to let grow the, the, the effective bond, the effective bond between a parent and a child, especially in fathers. Um, maybe that's what can be done. Thank you. Marie, for, um, adding another uh, dimension to the, 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 the topic. Um, so our second um, discussant is uh, Jane McNaughton, uh, who's a professor of medical humanities at Durham University and a co-director of the University Center for Medical Humanities. Uh, and she's been uh, centrally involved in the development of medical humanities in the UK for a number of years and indeed is part of the core group that set up the Association for Medical Humanities in 2000 with support from the Nuffield Trust. Uh, her research focuses on the idea of the symptom, its initial appearance, development and evolution in connection with medical contexts, habits and technologies. 
Jane, over to you. Well, thanks. Good afternoon. Or good evening, everybody. I'm sure you're all desperate to ask questions yourselves, so I'll try and make this fairly short. I did bring some slides, but um, uh, it was felt better maybe just to speak uh, to speak um, uh, a few perspectives. Now, I'm the, I'm the non-specialist uh, uh, common, uh, commentary on this, um, and it was just very interesting for me to look at the slides in advance and to hear the lecture. Um, I really appreciated Greg's point about interdisciplinarity. Um, this is the kind of lifeblood of our work in medical humanities and appreciate the, the problems in, the, in our world of deep disciplinary um, analysis, which is a real critical thing. But I got kind of, I think, three brief points I want to make from the point of view of my, with my medical humanities hat on, um, I'm interested in the notion of latency as being the kind of driving um, uh, theory, I think, behind the fact that some of these things are happening. My current research project is a project called The Life of Breath, and, that, and some of the kind of points that Greg was making about asthma and breathlessness are of interest to me. And with my kind of clinical hat on, I still work in, general, in, in clinical practice, I was a GP, the big question is, well, what can we do about it? How does the understanding of these mechanisms drive what we might actually be able to do? Um, and just, I think, uh, well, one of, the, one of the really interesting aspects of this idea of the notion of latent effects, something happens in childhood, or there's an environment in childhood, which means that something happens in later life. A very interesting idea, and Robbie, um, uh, who, uh, for, to whom I'm really grateful for the invitation to come, introduced me to this, an interesting paper on the theory of latent vulnerability in psychiatric illness. And that paper was talking about how mild, maltreatment in childhood can, uh, leads to three particular uh, problems. Psychiatric disorders are more likely to happen earlier, comorbidities with other problems are, are more likely, and disorders are more likely to be persistent and recurrent. And I think that was um, very interesting. The whole kind of issue that um, uh, that mind and body come together to 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 create these really profound changes, and that if we focus on either one or the other in the in without bringing them together in this interdisciplinary way, um, we're missing a heck of a lot. So the notion of of latent effects. One of the things that we got quite interested in in relation to my project on breathlessness, which, um, uh, which was thinking about what is the effect of waiting for something to happen. So if you, as an individual, understand that being of lower socioeconomic status has an influence on your life chances later or your health chances later, does that then spiral back and influence what happens to you? There's a question that, that possibly we might want to answer. And, move, and also within my, um, with, with my medical humanities hat on, one of the things that fascinated me reading uh, uh, Greg's um, lecture and also just from looking at some other aspects is that um, uh, we, are, we, are, we, we are moving a bit to thinking about the body um, through metaphors of machine imagery. Um, I had, had some of this on the slide, but one of the things that... Um, Greg um, mentioned in his lecture was the notion of programming effects, um, uh, and um, what uh, the 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 lecture the the paper on latent vulnerability talked of systems being calibrated in particular kinds of ways, um, and some of the work that I've read on on the um, on the neural uh, science of of breathlessness and brains by the neurophysiologists refers to things like, and I'll quote this, effective responses as like the output of an amplifier whose input is sensory intensity and gain is controlled by other factors. So we're talking very much in these kind of interesting machine-like ways. And I just thought I would briefly refer you to this fantastic book by the philosopher Mary Midgley, who um, reminds us to just watch some of our metaphors. Um, she says in her book, Machine Im imagery changes the worldview profoundly. She talks of machine imagery coming out at the time of the Enlightenment. Machine imagery changes our view worldview profoundly because machines are by definition under human control. If the world is essentially a machine, then it can be taken to pieces too and reassembled more satisfactorily. 
Um, so I think the, the language we use and the ways in which we express these issues can affect what we think we can do about them, how we can, we can make a difference. Um, in relation to my work on breathlessness, I was very interested um, in, in what Greg was saying about asthma, because one of the things that we've been looking at, it, we're very interested in COPD, chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, which is profoundly influenced by a, a, um, a perception of being stigmatized and, and, and by a perception of shame about that condition. But the other things we were, we were learning from somebody who's done work on childhood um, exposure, childhood asthma, is this point that one of the problems with lower socioeconomic status is that children's lungs don't reach their full capacity, or young people's lungs don't reach their full capacity because of the, a range of things like inflammation, like, like pollution, like the family environment, which may have cigarette smoke around. Um, full capacity is not reached, therefore it takes a shorter time to get to clinically significant COPD in later life. So again, I think that just underlines the fact what Greg was saying about the ways in which um, uh, the ways in which um, uh, um, context can very much affect um, what, what's going on um, in in in, uh, in the context of um, life experience. So I'm going to jump, I think, to 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 my final part, um, which is really with a clinician hat on, um, at the clinical call face, I think what we're interested in is what can we do as clinicians to make a difference? Um, how do we translate this understanding into something that, where we can actually help the patients we see in front of us who have got these kinds of, of problems? Um, and there's hope. I mean, Greg's saying, wait till tomorrow, you'll get more hope tomorrow. But um, the data does suggest we can do something. The this, this sense that there's heterogeneous, um, uh, heterogeneity in the data does suggest that we can make a difference. Human beings are dynamic systems, to use some of that machine imagery, um, which I think um, makes a difference. Um, what, one of the things that, that I think we're all probably aware of when we're working in clinical practice right now is that things can get worse rather than get better. We realize that against the background of austerity, I was looking at some data from the Joseph Rowntree Foundation, noticing that, that um, experience of anxiety and depression in people from lower socioeconomic uh, status is getting worse. Um, uh, loneliness is getting worse in the background of, of this, the kind of economic situation that we're in at the present moment. So I kind of, um, I wanted to finish um, my comments with, um, with a few words from, I think, a book that will be familiar to anyone who's worked in general practice, which is A Fortunate Man, John Berger's book. Um, because I think there's hope for us as clinicians in this situation. Um, we may be able to give our patients um, medication to support their um, inflammation. We may also be able to support our patients in ways that Marion was just talking about in terms of, um, of, of supportive um, parenting and understanding supporting parenting. Human relationships, in the end of the day, are critical. And as, as Berger says in this, talking about this wonderful country doctor that he um, observed and, and wrote about, he said, every week he reads the journals, but his satisfaction comes mostly from those cases where he faces forces which no previous explanation will exactly fit, because they depend on the history of a patient's particular personality. He tries to keep that personality company in its loneliness. And I think if we can keep uh, company and develop good relationships with our patients, it will help. Um, and I hope some of these new approaches will really profoundly influence things too. Thanks for listening. And I hope I've given you enough time to ask questions. So th I thank you very much, uh, Jane, for that. So what I would suggest is if, if uh, Greg, if, if you could come back up to the, uh, here and perhaps sit, sit here and, and uh, uh, Marion too, um, and uh, then uh, open the uh, floor to uh, questions. And uh, remember the, the critical thing is don't start speaking before you've got a microphone, which, where, where is the microphone? Would anyone uh, like to start the ball uh, rolling? Hi, I'm Carla. 
<laughs> and um, one of the questions I would, I would like to ask you, I understand that this escalates immensely the amount of work, uh, the difficulty of the things you presented, but have you been looking at associating with uh, childhood adverse events as well as social economical status? So the question was, have we looked at childhood adverse events um, in addition to socioeconomic stress? Yeah, absolutely. So, um, so one of the things about childhood adverse events, or at least as they're captured in you know some of the popular imagination in the U.S. and some of the texts, is that they, they they don't occur at random, right? Many of the things that are studied in the ACEs literature, including parental incarceration, parental psychiatric difficulties. Divorce and separation, having a being exposed to neighborhood or household violence, all of those things pattern in the U.S. by race and by class. Um, and in fact, we think of them as you know very important pathways through which um, social position relates to health. Um, I didn't have time to get to some of that work, and, and Edith's definitely going to allude to some of it tomorrow. But you know, I think that the the part of the talk that, that I didn't get to today that I often get to is trying to explain what some of those experiences are that kids have in their homes, in their neighborhoods, in their schools, and how those experiences are what really allow you to get from socioeconomic context into the brain and into the body. So absolutely important. Just not enough time to, to get to that. So, um, ah, yeah. Uh, just wait for your microphone, sorry. <laughs> John Barker, I'm uh, based in the Faculty of Law here in Cambridge. Um, I was wondering whether any equivalent studies are being done in developing countries, whether you have counterparts, say, in Africa or in other developing countries where you might have you know, HIV, AIDS-driven orphanages and parental attachment being a massive issue there. Um, other thing would be conflict zones, mm -hmm. and you might have access to those from refugees coming into the United States or into Britain or the Netherlands or wherever. But how much is this spilling over into drilling into the experience of other uh, regions of the world? <coughs> Yes, two, two things that I'd like to say about uh, um, different aspects of, of your question. The thing of <laughs> HIV, um, that might actually be a situation where you could wonder whether um, children with uh, HIV infection that they got from birth uh, would be better off with good medical care or with the care of their families, which are usually not happy, shiny families. Um, so we did a study into that issue actually in Ukraine where the, uh, the number of HIV infected children in institutions and in families is rather high and what we compared was children with and without HIV growing up in their biological families and in the institution. The institution where good medical care was taken of them with regular med medication of which you cannot always be sure in their families. Uh, and the comparison group without HIV was also from very low SES to matched on, on the same level. What we found was that even, so to say, not so good families, bad families, were better for the child, children's development, both in terms of their growth, their IQ development and their uh, emotional stability, than children in the institution. Actually, um, the, the, the comparison children who grow up in the biological families had an almost average score on IQ. Uh, the HIV infected children who grow up in their families, in their not happy, shiny families, had an average IQ of around 90. But the, those who grew up in the institution, either with or without, uh, HIV had an average IQ of uh, 75, so that's almost mentally retarded. 
whereas the uh, the the material circumstances in the uh, Ukrainian institutions were not that bad. They were not comparable to the Romanian situation. Uh, the ratio of caregivers to children were around uh, uh, five to one or two, three to one. But there was no stability of caregivers. Uh, by the time the children reached the age of five, most of them had seen more than 60 caregivers. And apparently this instability of the caregiving uh, environment is very detrimental to their environment. So that's the story in Ukraine. Then for refugees, how much of that uh, spills over to, to the situation in the countries that are rece the receiving countries where they live now. Um, the, the thing that I could highlight here is our Dutch study, the Netherlands study on the prevalence of child maltreatment, where we compared uh, immigrant families from longer ago, those who came as working force to the Netherlands, and those who come now as refugees. Uh, what we find is an increased risk for child abuse and neglect in both of these groups, but uh, if we control for socioeconomic status, the effects of the earlier immigrants, the working, the labor force working, the immigrants from Morocco and Turkey who came here for labor reasons, the uh, increased risk for child, for child maltreatment disappears completely. It's, they're only at increased risk because they have larger families, they are in lower socioeconomic status. But the increased risk in refugee families does not decrease when we control for these factors. So it's their own traumatic experiences probably that spill over to the next uh, generation. So that's really something for us to worry about and to, to take action in. Yes. Uh, this is for Marion. Um, did you do a correlation uh, between the outcome of the children and the cause of the father's absence? Um, a correlation between the child outcome and the father's absence. Um, I, I think you refer to the part of the, the cause of the father, the cause of the father's absence. Um, I think you relate to, to the first part of my uh, uh, my presentation, um, and the, the the Chetty study, as far as I know, uh, do not include reasons for father's absence. Mm -hmm. So, um, no, I, I can't answer that question. Hi, uh, my name is Elizabeth Corey Pierce, and I've come from the Tavistock Institute. And I just wanted to say thank you for the invitation and to add the point that when you talk about the um, extraordinary uh, multidisciplinary team, the interdisciplinarity of the work, I also wanted to add that I, I was really pleased that we were invited as an applied policy research institute, not an academic, so it's, it's cross-sectoral as well. One of my projects at the moment is on um, arguing for uh, greater service support to improve fostering care services around stability. So adoption is better than foster care at the moment for young people's outcomes. So it's really valuable for me to listen to all of this today. I, I'm not, I was an academic, I was a postdoc at Cambridge, but I can't sit down and read all of this stuff now. So it's just so useful um, to have this and what I've learned today and look forward to coming back tomorrow. So I just wanted to add that point as well about cross, the cross-sector nature of this work. Um, I should say, w w one of my projects is, um, is in a, I can't say where, but a regional borough of the country. And I mean, they're, they're bankrupt now from austerity. So, uh, so fi funding these issues, uh, foster care for children is, is, um, is a concern. And so the, the, the evidence that you're gathering is really valuable. Thank you. Thank you very much for that comment. Hi, um, I'm Anne-Laura van Harmelen in the Department of Psychiatry here, and I have a question for Greg Miller. Uh, thank you very much for that very inspiring talk. I was wondering, um, uh, after you mentioned uh, S.E. Amon's latent vulnerability model, in that model, um, there's a really important um, um, 
um, emphasis on threat reactivity in, in uh, children and adolescents who are growing up in a really stressful environment that that kind of threat reactivity that we find in them in the in the form of enhanced amygdala reactivity that that might be adaptive and adaptive response in the short term but then a, a vulnerability in the longer term i was wondering if uh, there is any such evidence for latent vulnerability in um, pro-inflammatory responses where short um, uh, pro well short-term pro-inflammatory responses are actually adaptive in high stress environments uh, but not in i know about the work on in uh, predicting mental health disorders later on, but I was wondering if there's any such um, uh, evidence for latent vulnerability there as well, because threat reactivity and the immune uh, system, uh, as you've described in your biological psychiatry uh, paper, are so inherently um, uh, intertwined, really. Thanks for that question. Yeah, yeah, they're intertwined in multiple ways. There's lots of crosstalk between, you know, cells that promote inflammation and threat regions of the brain. So multiple layers of connection. Um, you know, I don't know that there's there's great direct evidence to your point that, that the short-term response is a trade-off against long-term health. I think the kind of only evidence I can think of that really speaks to that directly is there was, um, there was a study in the New England Journal about 10 years ago that looked at a polymorphism in the gene that codes for this toll-like receptor that recognizes LPS. And it actually showed that um, people with one particular variant of the gene, um, they went through, they had extensive electronic medical records, were much less likely to present with infectious diseases throughout their life course, but much more likely to end up with an atherosclerotic MI later on, sort of speaking with this idea that maybe, you know, the cost of having a strong antimicrobial response is long-term atherosclerosis. That, and that's not a direct find, you know, but that, that's probably the closest I know of looking at this trade-off hypothesis. Maybe somebody will genetically engineer mice at some point to, to really look at it, but it's an interesting idea. My name is Diana Dean from the charity What About the Children? I'm research director. Um, so Professor Miller and Professor Bachmann Vonnerberg. Um, my question is, would you consider out-of-home group childcare for babies of eight months to 20 months an adverse childhood experience considering their levels of cortisol are permanently raised and they are stressed all the time, most of the time? <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. There is no one single answer to, to that issue for the quality of daycare centers uh, vary so immensely. What is most important is stability of childcare, uh, of, of, of uh, childcare arrangements, and that can be at home. That, in theory, can be at a good, stable daycare center. Uh, but I do realize that um, uh, daycare work is quite underestimated. Uh, it's, it's low paid work. There are many uh, changes in the, um, in the daycare providers. Mm -hmm. So to create a, a stable uh, caregiving uh, environment at daycare is a, is, is a, is a challenge. Um, it's, it's not true that absolutely uh, that the qui m most quiet environment for a child is, is is the best one. Some there may be some challenge. Uh, I mean, if a child would experience no cortisol uh, reactivity during the day, we might wonder whether he has enough stimulation. Some stimulation is good, and good childcare quality has been found related also to better, uh, for instance, language development and social development. Uh, but we also face the fact that it's difficult to find good quality daycare. And that's absolutely true. And I think one of the reasons for that is that we under-evaluate, we undervalue the, uh, the value of good <coughs> childcare and are not willing to, uh, to make enough funds available to create it. 
Thank you very much, all of you three, for your great presentations. Um, I'm Jessica. I'm from the Department of Psychiatry here. Um, I'm also interested in, in childhood adversity, but I my question now would be more about the definition of SES. I'm wondering, um, I remember the definition of SES you have given for the Minitoba study where you defined SES as um, the size of the land the parents owned, I think, if I, if I got it correctly. Um, I was wondering, have you also looked into different aspects of SES? Because I could imagine that, that it might make a huge difference whether you look at the academic level of the parents or the social level or only the financial level. Because I could imagine that there are many academics or early career academics who do not have much money, which doesn't mean that there would be bad parents. <laughs> so I would assume, <laughs> at least. So yeah, the question is, ha have you looked at different aspects of, of SES? Yeah, it's an excellent question. Um, so, you know, I think at the extremes, they, they generally converge. Um, you know, occupational status, education, wealth, income. Um, but in the middle of the distribution, you're right, there's, there's discordance. So you have, you know, you have public servants who, you know, are working in government and make limited amounts of money but have high education or really high occupational prestige. Academics, high occupational prestige and education, limited income. You have professional athletes, you know, who make gobs of money, but typically have lower education. Um, so they can, you know, they they can diverge. Um, I think there's been, you know, there's been historically a lot of interest in in kind of the disparities world and understanding how different, you know, SES is not one thing, and you know, it's shorthand to use, as I did in the talk. But 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 you're right that you know, in using the shorthand, you obscure the the, the multidimensionality of it. There's been a lot of interest in trying to parse the relative importance of different aspects. You know, so on the one hand, you have purely sort of material resource issues that are often you know, captured in measures of income and in wealth. Um, and then on the other hand, you have things that are more related to prestige, the occupation, education, both resource and prestige, and also knowledge. Um, and then there's sort of subjective perceptions too. Where do people feel like they stand in their own networks and their own communities that may very well be fairly independent of, of their income or education, that in their own communities people fit, may, may feel more or less valued and have more or less status. You know, there hasn't, to my mind, been a consistent and replicable pattern of evidence coming out suggesting that one type is more important than others. Um, it may be that, that given the, the fairly linear, linear nature of the gradient, that at different points along the gradient, different things matter. So that income and wealth really matter a lot at the bottom end of the gradient, just in terms of getting to basic services and basic needs met. But then once you get past that threshold, which is gonna be community specific, things like prestige and education come more into play. That's how I tend to think about it. I haven't seen much in the way of empirical tests of that kind of hypothesis. But, but it's certainly plausible and it's an important question to ask. Certainly, it has lots of bearing on, on policy, right? So if, if what's important is education, um, then that's probably an easier policy sell than wealth re redistribution. Um, so. All right, so I, I'm conscious of the uh, time. Um, so I, I think I'd like to wrap things up now. Um, first of all, I'd, I'd like to s s s uh, thank very much again the uh, speakers. Um. Um, and, and I think that, yeah, the, the more the discussion has gone on, uh, the, the, uh, it, it's apparent how sort of complex and, and difficult and, and how in, it, intersectoral indeed this, this topic uh, is. Um, Thank you very much for all the contributions from the floor, which have also emphasized the intersectoral uh, nature of this uh, work. Um, and uh, thank you to, to uh, Guy and, and, and Robbie for setting up this fantastic uh, event. Um, looking forward to uh, day uh, two, just to uh, uh, remind people, uh, it's the same sort of time, isn't it, to, 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 to tomorrow. And uh, the, the, the plenary talk will be by Professor Edith uh, Chen, uh, and and I, I, I understand that she's going to give all the answers. Uh, <laughs> the, the, the title is uh, Resilience, Maintaining Good Health in the Face of uh, Adversity. And, and we'll have two, two more discussants uh, then. Uh, 
uh, Professor Pasco Fearon and uh, Professor Marinus uh, van Eisendorn. So looking forward to uh, tomorrow evening. And, and again, just uh, thank you very much to everyone for your uh, participation in this event. Thanks.